Welcome to GrantPlantel.com where we're passionate about building confidence through education. Today we have the powerhouse Christine Mankies and Ian Fanica where we're going to be interviewing them about their successes and some of their failures. I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Cheers. Okay, so welcome to GrantPlantel.com. We've got Ian and Christine with us today. Thanks. Thanks for being with us guys. Thanks for having us. Awesome, man. So I'm going to ask you uh, the first question to get everything going. So tell us where you guys grew up. So I actually grew up in the Northern Cape, so okay. in a tiny town that uh, most people don't know about. Uh, the big towns around was Kimberley and Uppington, so that gives you an idea. Uh, it's called Prisca, right next to the Orange River. And I lived there until 1994 when I was turned 11. And then we moved to Stellenbosch and was there primary school, high school, university, so pretty much grew up in Stellenbosch in the Northern Cape. Yeah, I was born in Joburg and I lived there till I was about four years old. I uh, can't really remember a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then we moved to Somerset West. Yeah, and I've lived there all my life. How did a, a Joburg poppy and a Kimberly Boyke <laughs> land up getting together? <laughs> I don't think I was a Joburg poppy because <laughs> I was only four years old. So <laughs> um, yeah, we met uh, through mutual friends um, at the age of 17. So we've been together for a very, very long time. And um, yeah, I met at Stellenbosch. Um, he was an all boys school, I was an all girls school. Um, and yeah, we met through friends and we dated for nine and a half years and then he proposed. So <laughs> that's, yeah. that's yeah. The, the, the short <laughs> <she> story. Yes. <laughs> cool. So tell us more about uh, the big day, the wedding day. Well, what do you want to know? <laughs> so where did you guys get married? Who did the photos? Uh, well, maybe I should start where we got engaged. Ian proposed while I, or the day after I shot a wedding in Germany. So Germany has a very close place in our hearts. So we, he proposed there. And then on the flights, it was actually very cool because I had about 12 hours to uh, plan the wedding. Oh, so wow. <laughs> on the flights, I decided to make the list of the guests, choose all the service providers, and being in the wedding industry made it quite easy. Yeah. So I knew all the people that I wanted to use for the wedding. Um, and when Ian and I got back the next day, I already contacted everyone and we got married in um, Wellington. It's just outside Stellenbosch um, at Klein of Alley. And um, the photographs was, were done through a friend of mine who lives in America, Julie Lim. Oh, wow, that's brilliant. Okay, great. And when, when did the two of you first realize that you are passionate about business? For me, uh, there was probably never a time that I was not passionate about business. So it wasn't like a defining moment. I grew up in a, a very entrepreneurial home. Um, my dad, as far as I know, never worked for a big company. You know, he, he was never climbing the corporate ladder as such. So it was always a, a question of uh, making things happen and coming up with ideas and figuring things out and solving problems. That was, that was how I was brought up. And so I've always had a passion for business. There was never a, a question of doing anything other than that. Yeah, I think for me it was a little bit different. Um, my parents were more, I always want to say, more traditional couple. And my dad's worked for the same company all his life. Um, but for me it was, I think, at the time that I went to study art um, and understanding the fact that I wanted to do something that's creative, I wanted to do something that I'm passionate about. So after school I decided to do something creative. But with all of that I also realized that I can't, make a living for myself if I don't change the creativity into a business and that's also when Ian and I started talking more about like what we want to do with our lives etc and he was I think one of the big inspirations for me to think about the path of being an entrepreneur and um, yeah and taking that creativity and design that I studied and to turn it into something that you can sell to someone mm -hmm. and yeah so it kind of started there. So you, you two are, are quite an entrepreneurial powerhouse. <laughs> How, has this always been something that's driven the two of you together? And have you guys, how do you guys complement each other with that? Yeah, I think for me and Ian, it's definitely something that drives us. It's funny because we'd go out for like a breakfast on a Saturday. If I don't have a wedding or if I don't have yeah. other commitments, it would be kind of like, let's take time off, you know, go to a coffee shop, have a nice breakfast. <laughs> After the first coffee, we're like, you know what, I have this idea. We should even <laughs> take out a yeah. pen and paper. And <laughs> yeah, we end up like just thinking of ideas all the time. So it's always, I think, been part of 
Yeah, yeah I think so are. definitely. I, I can still remember when we were dating and you know, being in varsity, going to coffee shops and discussing business ideas and um, yeah, just ideas in general, I think really inspire us. Um, but they're not letting it stop. They're actually doing something about that. And I think, I think there's interesting ways in which we complement each other. And, and, and I think that's a really great um, dynamic in the relationship. Uh, we, we've never worked for each other. We actually haven't worked at the same company yeah, as such. <laughs> it's always been different companies, different responsibilities, but a, a very nice synergy and a, a very nice collaboration taking place. And I think that's been uh, a key aspect to, uh, you know, a couple or a relationship doing work together or doing business yeah. together. Um, I know what, what I'm good at and what she's good at, and we try not mm -hmm. to step on each other's toes in that sense because I, I know it would be stupid for me to do something that I know Christina's better at, and yeah. I, I think the feeling's mutual, so. Yeah, I think we really have like a skill set that works very well together. So, like Ian said, like he's strong in certain aspects, I'm strong in other aspects, and I, I remember the, I think, first projects we ever did together was when I was still studying as a designer, and Ian was studying law and business, but he did web design in his free time. So those two things worked very well together. So I yeah. had design ideas, but he had clients. And so he wasn't really, that wasn't really his strong point on the designing side. And those were the smaller projects we worked on. And I think there's certain things we love to do together. And then there's certain things we know if you give that task to that person, he'll complete it. And the same for me, so. Okay, brilliant. Uh, is, is one of you more of an initiator and, or a dreamer, or are you both pretty equal when it comes to initiating and dreaming up new ideas? I think it's a very interesting combination. I don't think it's as, as simple as that. So it, to one extent, Christina's definitely the, the big dreamer, big ideas, uh, yeah. big vision, yeah, big, uh, picture. <laughs> big picture, wants to change the world with e everything she does. Um, she'll come up with an idea and then I'll figure out how we're going to make it happen. Um, but in the same way, uh, th those roles almost flip around sometimes where um, Christine's much more detail orientated than I am and I'm much more uh, theoretical, much more abstract, much more about the process and the system and the, the implementation of, yeah. of um, the concepts. Uh, those are the things that excite me really. So it's, it's very interesting. It's a combination of yeah. both uh, big picture and detail happening on, on each side, um, yeah. which, which we enjoy. Ian loves the theory of why things work and how it will work and figuring it out, etc. I really don't care about <laughs> it. I was just like, let's just do it. <laughs> you know, so it's like, <laughs> figure yeah. it out when we sleep tonight, <laughs> but tomorrow morning I want to start doing it. Yeah. She'll be doing it and I'll explain why we're actually doing it like this. And she'll oh, go really? like, yeah, of course, that's, that's, what I, that's what I've been doing. Yeah. I, I really operate on intuition. So I think that's why I don't really think a lot about all the theory. And it's kind of like, it just kind of comes to me. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, Ian will figure it out. And then two days later, he's like, yes, I think that's, that's great. We should do it. I was like, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's... I mean, that's such a great combination. I mean, not many people have that combination yeah. to work with. So that, that intuition that you're talking about, that gut feeling, yeah. where, where have you derived that from? Or have you, have you taught, has it like been built over time? Or is it just something that has just always been there? I, I think it's always been there. I can probably think of a lot of theories and like spin it in a nice way, yeah. <laughs> but it's really just always been there. My mom's the same way. So I've got very good feelings for people, for business ideas. Yeah. Um, I really operate. That's the first thing I think about like, um, but in all aspects of life, it's just always been like, if, if it feels right, it's the right thing to do. If, I, if it doesn't feel right, I just leave it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just always been there. So you've learned to, to trust that from a very early age, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool, because so many times you just, you don't know if it's like something you should actually go with or if it's something you like should just leave, you know? Yeah. I don't think I would lie if I said I had the answers to everything because yeah. I don't think that's true. And I still go through a lot of times where I'm like, should we do this? Shouldn't we do the, that? Or, you know, thinking about whether that's the right almost opportunity because I think as you grow your business more and more opportunities come your way and you have to really decide which ones you go with so those aren't always that easy but if it's a I think that initial kind of step or um, yeah if it's also meeting with people knowing whether that's the right person to work with or not like it's, yeah. it comes easy for me to, yeah, to really kind of decide that but yeah, I think that's where Ian and I differ, but it's also a very good thing because a lot of times he will bring questions that I wouldn't have thought about. Yeah, which so is he's so nice, eh? Yeah, he's he's the guy that really like he would do a lot of research Analyzes and 
analyzes. You know, it's like when we go shopping, okay? I'm the person who walks and I was like, I want that vase, <laughs> three of those, etc. and let's walk, you know? And, and he's the guy that's like, I need a watch. Okay, what watch do you need? <laughs> and he researches for like five months on the internet. I, I, I don't think I've ever made an impulse buy. I, I, he does not do anything impulsively. That, so. I was like, let's just do it. <laughs> Whatever it is, I want to I wanna make, make sure it's the right thing and why and do my research and understand and I want to know. And, and make sure you get the best deal. Right? Yes, of course. But the yeah. problem is by the time he's made his decision, it's not available anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's my problem. Yeah, I was I like, know. do you want this jacket or not? Next week, it's not in the store anymore. Let's just get it. <laughs> so I, I literally have a book about making decisions. This was, uh, we, we love books and love reading. And I was in the bookshop. I saw this. I'm like, I'm buying this. And I'm very excited to show Christine this book. I, I think it's amazing. Decision, right? uh, no, no, no. I, I spent some time, read the back, <laughs> checked out the authors, Googled really? the name. Yeah, of course. And um, she's like, why do you want to buy that book? It's stupid. And I'm like, it's, it's amazing. I really like it. And so the book is about decision making. And all it is, it's on every page, there's a different model for how to make a decision. It's oh, the really theory a of decision a, making. A, a Venn diagram or a matrix or some sort of an analogy. And I just think it's brilliant. I, I love it. I have no and idea uh, why anyone would buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to do it, do it or don't. You just no, make the I decision. I want to explain why. And it makes sense. And it's... I'm using this theory. It channels the thinking. I love that. <laughs> That's why I need deadlines <laughs> for Ian. <laughs> awesome. So, with, with I mean, uh, the reason why I'm harping on the whole gut feeling and that, I think it's quite an important thing for entrepreneurs to come to terms with and, and be able to understand it a little bit better. For you guys, has it been more successful, like following your gut feeling, or have you also had some failures through that process? I think we've definitely had failures. I think all entrepreneurs should probably have failures. Oh, but um, for me, it's been, I think, mostly successful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, I think um, definitely had failures and, and successes in various degrees, but I wouldn't attribute it to you know, either, either form of making a decision. Mm. I think that, that gut feeling is very important. I just, I just get my gut feeling in a different way than a, yeah. but if it doesn't feel right, we, I can't imagine that we would ever do that. Um, I, I think entrepreneurship is, is completely irrational and unreasonable. Mm. And to be able to do anything like that without having your whole heart and soul in it, convinced that this is a thing to do, there's no ways you're gonna make it. Mm. You know, they, they, they say that you need passion to make a success as an um, entrepreneur. Yeah. So you, you don't need, passion doesn't guarantee success, but if you don't have passion, there's no ways you're gonna put in the yeah. work and, and get there. And I think that, that equates with the gut feeling. If, if it feels right, you'll be willing to put in the time and the effort and the hard work and the, the late nights and whatever it takes to make it happen. So yeah, um, yeah whether it's successful or not, um, I wouldn't change the way uh, I'm making that decision. It's always gonna come down to, you know, I, I, I feel that this is a thing to do. I get there through models and rationalizing and thinking about it, but at the end, that's how I justify my gut feel. Mm -hmm. Where for Christine, it comes much more natural, much quicker. So, and, and that's one of the areas where I've learned to, to trust her uh, opinion and her gut feel in yeah. that sense, yeah. You know, many times you, you have to go for that gut feel because I think for me, if, if I sit on it too long, then the passion will also go. Mm -hmm. And the passion helps me to like make it happen so it's yeah sometimes I make decisions very quickly it doesn't mean it's going to be successful but success can be determined in many ways like maybe the outcome was not what you wanted but you probably learned something through it so it doesn't mean it wasn't successful in yeah. that way you know so I think for us it's also been like let's rather test things especially being in tech like there's so many things that's changing all the time so you need to sometimes just take that Leap of faith, you yeah. know, and, and just go for it. And then if it didn't work out the way you did, at least you test it and you know you can move on. Otherwise, you always kind of wonder. That's, that's one of the yeah. things I think yeah. we spoke about quite recently is just to not really wonder about things, to, to try it. You know it works or it doesn't. You can go on because then you can also pass on that advice to Most other entrepreneurs yeah. and just say, listen, we've tried this. It didn't work for our industry, et cetera. Now we're trying something else. Yeah, yeah we'd, we'd much rather fail and know yeah. than uh, not trying and wondering. Yeah, I think, I think that's brilliant. I mean, at the end of the day, we actually learn more from our mistakes than our successes, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, to understand it from that perspective is wonderful. Now, talking about passion, mm. you guys have both come to terms with your passion at a, at a very young or early stage in your careers. How did that come about? Well, I think for me, I have a lot of different passions, but the main thing was always to do something creative. Yeah. So... 
um, whether that is in the making food, whether it's painting, whether it's, you know, what, I don't know, like there's so many different things, but I met um, a local photographer at the age of 14. And I think that's probably where the photography passion started and everything was initiated from there basically. And um, I started assisting her. Um, I became her assistant uh, up until I went to varsity. And then there I had to make a decision, you know, was I gonna become a full-time photographer? Was I gonna study? What was I gonna do? And I wanted to further my studies. And there, I think more passions opened up because I didn't really know anything about design or computers or anything like that. So yeah, that's where that started. So it was quite young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my passion in, in broad terms has always been business. And um, I think the, the weird part where I had to come to terms with that was um, after studying or e even while studying, uh, speaking to people in the industries, obviously scoping out, you know, future plans and careers and th those kind of things. And this question of passion would always come up and my answer would always be, I, I want to do business. That's what I enjoy. I find it fascinating. And uh, then the next question invariably is, okay, what business or what industry or, you know, what kind of thing do you want to do? And I never had an answer for that. Yeah. That was never, um, I was never set on that. Um, I, I, I'm interested in the concept of business. So wh whatever that might be, um, I was I was fascinated by it. And so the, the technology side of it and the creative and the design and the development side came actually as a hobby. Um, and and that sort of collided with the business passion. And, and that's that's where it sort of came together. Yeah, I think if you if you realize you have a passion, it's like especially like for Ian, like knowing that the passion is business. I, I remember when we were much younger, I think still at school, I actually one day I asked him, I, I knew that he was into business and he always read these business books. And I asked him, but you're going to become a businessman, right? And he was like, yes. And I was like, okay, but what business are you going to be in? <laughs> it was, was that's how I kind of yeah. thought about it. And he was like, well, I don't really, don't really care, you know, if I sell chickens or whether I rent stuff or what. <laughs> I was like, that's so weird because in my mind, it's like you have to choose a specific yeah. kind of <laughs> occupation. And he was like, he doesn't really care. But I, I, I re well, not, not really care. Sorry, that's off Afrikaans way of saying it. He doesn't mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, I realized that with, with Ian, also with the design, like you just have to start doing something in some way. I think that's like we realized, I think mm. for a lot of people, are, they're very passionate about the idea yeah. of business, but they never start. Yeah. And that's a big problem. So I don't think for us, maybe what we're doing now is not what we'd be doing in 20 or 30 years from now, but it's mm. to kind of get a foot in the door, yeah. you know? So for us to start with like small websites or mm. I still remember um, the other day, actually when we were cleaning the house, we came on like boxes of like old invoices. It was so <laughs> funny. And it's like these old invoices we made for for um, like small businesses. And it was like done on wood. And it's like these simple, simple things. Yeah. And it was like 200 Rand poster for some <laughs> band, you know? And I was like, 200 Rand, great, you know? <laughs> and, but that was just like the foot in the door. And it's to kind of start living that passion. And as you go forward, you start realizing how you can actually do this. I yeah, I think I, th I think actually a very valid point is th the idea of passion. It, it can almost be um, daunting in the fact that most people don't necessarily know what they are passionate about, and so you wait for your your passion yeah. and then go and pursue that. Because I think much more the the reality oh. is that you discover it as that's you go along. Exactly yeah. So as soon as you start to do something, that's when you're like, wow, wait, exactly. this makes sense. This makes me tick. This yeah. this makes yeah. me want to do more. And and so. Um, the, the passion f on my side for technology and those kind of mm -hmm. things, that was never part of the picture. Growing up, it was not an option. I mean, the, the, what we're doing now didn't exist in my mind at that age, but I still, I was interested in the business side of things. And yeah. as we got uh, into the, the technology side of things, then it became interesting and, and discovered it more and more. Yeah. 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 It's, it's actually just a road of, res of discovery of luck. Just taking it as it goes. Yeah. And, and I think that is fundamental when it comes to any startup is that you actually just need to start, yeah. you know? I mean, as soon as you get to the point where it's a delay and you're not gonna get going, then it's just never gonna happen. And I think that's where the biggest problem comes with most entrepreneurs is that they just don't get started. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's and why you call it a startup, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just starts. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not a dream up, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so a lot of times when I deal with my clients uh, and, we, and, I, and I ask them to put together a business plan for whatever dear, idea they have, they're actually very hesitant mm. because it intimidates them. Yeah, yeah. And it's just a starting point, you know? And t the funny thing is I'm not even the biggest fan of business plans because it's exactly what you said earlier is that it changes. Yeah. 
as you start, <laughs> everything that you thought it was going to be, it's going to change as you go along. Cool. So Ian, tell us more about uh, studying law and you, your CFP as well, and now you're in the tech world, completely <laughs> two different spectrums. Yeah, so uh, the, the tech part actually started before the law. So I had a very small business selling like little jewelry stuff, I think. <laughs> Uh, it was actually, so my, my, my sisters had, uh, not, a, not a business, they were making little jewels for themselves because they found the place where you can buy it wholesale yeah. and uh, they could make their own jewelry for cheaper. And um, I don't have any brothers, so obviously very close <laughs> to my sisters and I would look at them making these things and I was, it was interesting. And the, the business side kicked in and I'm like, wait, what do you buy it for? And how much, you know, would you pay to, to get one and oh your friends are interested in having some more and <laughs> it turned out I, I bought all their stock and I started like a little <laughs> production line and got some friends to to make these little jewelry things for for girls and um, this was now about 1997 I think where e-commerce was like the buzzword this is now this is the next big thing and uh, so obviously I had to sell my stuff online <laughs> <you know? laughs> and um, that's actually where the website stuff came well came started. to being so I, I wanted to sell my little jewelry thing is online never got around to that the <laughs> I, one of my mom's friends got got heard uh, or heard that I'm I can build websites and so they paid me to do one for them and I made much more money than <laughs> making little jewelry things selling it for a few rand so uh, pivoted, I guess, <laughs> pursued that wholeheartedly. <laughs> and then when it came to studying, I, I wanted to go study business. That was the obvious, obvious choice. And so the, the website stuff was always a hobby, playing around on computer, it was just for fun. And my parents actually suggested to, to study law as well. Uh, my dad did a bit of um, law studies um, when, when he was younger and he thought it suited my personality, he thought it would be something that, that I'd find interesting. So I did the combination of uh, business and law, and I, I found it fascinating. I absolutely loved studying it. Um, the long-term goal was never to be a lawyer. I didn't want to practice law. I wasn't interested in the law profession. I was interested in the, in the concepts and the theories and the, the, the abstraction yeah. of, of life. That, that was fascinating. And I think the reason I enjoyed the law study so much was it's not something that you ever do at school. You know, mathematics or biology, yeah. BSCs. Um, science, engineering, there's, there's touches of that that you do in, in school subjects yeah. and this was brand new, nothing like that um, I've ever been exposed yeah. to so uh, that's why I really enjoyed the studies uh, of law and then combining that with business and uh, when I finished that I had to decide to, to take an article job to do my, my law practical in order to become a qualified lawyer and you know, get a proper job and those kind of things. <laughs> and I didn't feel quite ready for that yet, yeah. so I decided to study some more. And uh, <laughs> <Great. laughs> the, the, the business-minded <laughs> side of me came in, so the, the CFP course uh, was suggested by someone I, I spoke to. Uh, and I was able to do that in, in one year, so I decided to take that on. And with that, I also did a um, business course in, in the city, and the days of class actually worked out perfect. So two days a week, CFP, one day a okay, week, and it was the, the correct days. And then I figured, well, it's all evening classes, so I'll, I'll have my whole day open, so let's just start a business as well. So <laughs> started our first sort of official business that was registered with partners and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's how all of that sort of was thrown in together in, in one year, which was absolutely mad, it was crazy. And um, by, so by the end of the CFP, again, I had to do a practical and I had to decide if I wanted to take a real job. And the idea was that, you know, you get a, a job, get qualified, uh, work, uh, build up a network, and then eventually do your own thing. And I remember sitting thinking, but wait, I'm doing my own thing already. Why would I want to, you know, work for someone else and take that route? And then at some point, I'll, I'm going to have to decide I'm going to leave the safety of a salary and a you know, obviously a, a network and a secure income, yeah. uh, probably be married at that point, and then I'm going to have to say, no, wait, I'm going to give all of that up uh, in order to try something. And I just didn't see myself with the, with the ability to do that, actually. So yeah. I, I think I was extremely naive, uh, optimistic, and <laughs> probably scared, and therefore <laughs> I, I went for it and uh, decided to do our own thing. Yeah. And I think, like, w one thing that I think a lot of entrepreneurs battle with today is that fear. You know, and I mean, that's part of the reason why we do th all these studies. I mean, we go to college to go get a job uh, or study something so that once we finish studying it, we can go into that avenue. And I think it's, it's amazing that you just studied it yeah. to get the background knowledge. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, what do you got to lose? Yeah. You know, which is fantastic. But 
How did you get over that fear of, of, of not going into that safety zone of practicing law? I think the, what I realized was the sooner I, I almost get out of it. So if I were to take a, a candidate job, um, I would have been paid a salary. I would have started to, to get qualified and then opportunities in that field would have opened up. And, and I realized uh, probably by luck that it would become much harder later on. Mm. So even though I was scared in initially, I realized the sooner I do this, the, the easier it, it would be. And obviously at that point, it was a, it was a much more safer choice to make. Uh, I had my parents who supported me. Mm. Uh, you know, living experiences, you're pretty much a student, so you can, you can get away with a, a lot um, to, yeah, to just have lower overheads in general in, in life. Um, and so I think that's probably the, the way to navigate fear is to, to almost make it an, a, an easier decision. It's yeah. not necessarily that you have to go from having a proper paid safe job and just cut everything and go to zero. Uh, that, that would be extremely scary. But the, the doing something on the side, seeing if it works out, do a little you know, low cost probes, uh, beta test, whatever you want to call it, do a, a minimum viable pro product or project. and. Uh, that would be the way to navigate fear, so to not have to go from you know zero to one hundred in in one jump. I think that's extremely scary, because um, I mean fear is part of the the, the package. You're not yeah. gonna you're not gonna right. escape fear. It it will be there. It's a question of navigating that and uh, and taking steps to negate it. Yeah, cool, Christine. You're not just a famous photographer. You've also got one of the most famous websites or blogs in South Africa called the Pretty Blog. Tell us how that <laughs> came about. Well, um, I think the first thought about the Pretty Blog happened about five years ago. Um, with Ian being in the tech world, and I still remember that day when he told me, you should start a blog, you know? <laughs> and I was like, what is this? Um, but this was still the photography blog that I just started. And he told me about Blogger. And he said, you know what, you should get on this. This is going to be big. You know, he, he's a very early adopter. And consequently, I've become one. But he, he was just saying, like, you should really get onto this. And we were still building, like, a flash website at that stage for, for my portfolio, I remember. That was like, <laughs> thank goodness for WordPress. <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, we were building this website and I remember I couldn't really update it uh, the way I wanted to, you know, with my photography, etc. So he introduced me to Blogger. I got onto that and that really just helped my business boom in like a really short period because I could show my clients their work really quickly. And with all of this, I started following a lot of international blogs. And um, obviously it wasn't very popular in South Africa yet. But with that whole process of following international wedding blogs and getting to know like, kind of what the industry is going for and what's happening, I realized that inspiration is happening online now. And that magazines and a lot of the printed material, it's very limited for a bride because you, you maybe have one or two editions a year. And that bride might get engaged within the period where there isn't any editions on the, mm. on the shelf, you know. So she's kind of stuck. So what does she do? She phones her friends and she gets old magazines or something, you know, which doesn't really make sense. Yeah. So what happened in the same time um, when I was kind of realizing this move happening within the wedding industry. And remember, this was before Pinterest. It was before even like Facebook kind of just started in South Africa, all that kind of stuff. So... It was very different, you know, then, yeah, very different from now. And um, a lot of the brides would come to my house and they would meet up with me to book me as the wedding photographer, but they would end up being here for almost two hours, <laughs> you know, and, and I never understood, like, why are they here for so long, you know? I love them, but seriously. And they'd sit here and they'd go through all the albums and the mom and the bridesmaids and everyone's like, oh, where did you get these flowers, you know? Oh, where's that venue, you know? And I realized that there was a big need um, for brides to get inspiration, but not just visual inspiration, but also information, you know? Yeah. Where do we really get these service providers? And um, then I started comparing w what their need was like to what was available. And I realized it was either magazines, which was like printed material, which had very limited information in. And then there was like your online directories, more your yellow pages kind yeah. of idea. And I said to you, there's just no like blogs like you have in America. And um, yeah, that's how the idea of the Pretty Blog came. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a new idea. It was yeah. kind of, I think the reason why the Pretty Blog became so big was we were at the right time at the right place and we were one of the first movers within that space. Mm. Um, and then we started out as a wedding blog um, with my photography and a lot of my friends and we started moving into the industry. And then um, 
yeah, then we also decided to move into lifestyle. So now the Pretty Blog has become something that is um, not just wedding. We, 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 yeah. we really believe that it, it starts with wedding, you know. Yeah. Um, that's when girls get really excited about all the pretty things. <laughs> <laughs> and then they kind of stick around. They want to, like, make pretty food. They want to make their home beautiful. And, yeah, so that's how it started. Okay, and, and tell us a bit, a bit more about the journey. I mean, you guys literally started from doing just weddings, and now you do full-on lifestyle i mean yeah. your your website is a full-on interactive website with f lots of information <laughs> how did you guys get so big so quickly oh it's it's a bit of a blur to be honest <laughs> it's just been like whoa crazy um but i think that's where the the big dream uh, in me um it's i think it's a project that kind of come to life because of my my big dreams and ideas um but at the stage that I had the idea, I was really busy with my photography and I, I knew I didn't have the time to to just put all of that into the blog. So I reached out to a friend, which was actually a, um, one of my clients at that stage, Nicola, um, and she became one of my co-founders for The Pretty Blog. And yeah. so she was the person who helped me to actually put the content out there. Um, and so she became the editor. And... Firstly, as I said, you know, it was kind of things we found on the internet that we kind of posted, you know, or just finding yeah. pictures on Pinterest <laughs> and putting it on there. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people in South Africa probably didn't know about Pinterest. So we're like, yeah. oh, we can find all these beautiful things put it on there, you know. Cool. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> and within a few months, we realized that um, we can't really do that. We really need to be different. Like mm. if, if we knew that the um, idea of blogs was not going to be um, new for a long time. So we needed to find something that would make us different and stand out. And so... Um, Nicola and I decided to produce a lot of our own content, just like a magazine. So it was literally the magazine um, business model almost, but for online. Yeah. So we decided to produce our own content. We started reaching out to great service providers, people that we knew would produce beautiful content. And, and that's how we, became, um, how we got this whole model of like contributors on the site. We've got a lot of girls doing DIYs for us. We've got food. And a lot of the stuff we still produce in-house as well, but sure. we we kind of use a team, you know, that's, yeah. that's how we do it. I mean, there's no way we could do it by ourselves. And that's why I will say the pretty blog, it's, it's kind of been an industry thing. It's not yeah. just us. I think we drive it and we've created the platform, um, but we need the people out there. We need the people who make the beautiful things to be part of it. Um, and it's just facilitating that, seeing where the industry is going and making changes and moves. And yeah, so we yeah. kind of become the platform um, and that's what we do. And we just always on the lookout for, for new ideas, for new people, and... Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, hey? Now, tell us a bit more about how you guys took the concept of a blog mm -hmm. and made it into a profitable business. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's not something that's just anyone can do. So, how, how did that come about? I mean, how, how much time do we have? <laughs> 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 I need like a flip chart or something now. <laughs> it's like, it can get complicated. <laughs> but uh, I'll keep it simple. Um, I think, yeah, as I said, it's, it's basically, a, I think, a, the model of kind of a magazine. So I think the first thing to, to look at was not to see the pretty blog as a blog, even though it says the pretty blog, yeah. you know but to look at the pretty blog as, as a platform and to look at it as, as a publication and to say, okay, if this was really worth what we think it's worth yeah. um, for our viewers or for advertisers, what would we offer them? So it was really to turn what you're doing um, into a product mm. um, and to turn it into something that other people would value because mm. if, they'd valued it, if they value it, they would, be, they would be willing to give us something yeah. in return. Um, and so... For, for that, it was yeah, basically creating a platform that was that had obviously readers. You know that's important is to have your audience, yeah. um, but then also to make sure that that audience is the right people. Um, we really wanted to niche it towards the kind of content that we produce. We didn't want to say we are the woman blog in South yeah. Africa. We wanted to say definitely this target market. That's who we are, and we knew if we could penetrate that market and and make sure that people look at us as one of the top blogs for that specific niche, we knew that all businesses within that niche would be interested in becoming part of, of our, of our yeah. business. So it's a very long journey. It's not, I think for us, it's probably been a very quick journey for what we've done, but it's still been four or five years to get to this point. And um, yeah, to change it into something that's profitable, 
um, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, I think for us, it's been there's been a lot of things that we had to consider and change, and uh, especially being in this space, it's quite new. You know, the whole online publishing mm. space, even though it's been around for a while, to make a profit off it is is not that easy. Yeah. Uh, especially if you start looking at brands, they um, maybe smaller brands. You know, they not really they don't really know what the return on online is yet. And it's, it's something that's very new in that industry. So it's been a very big learning curve for us and also a big educational process for the industry. So we really have to go to bigger advertisers and actually educate them about what we do mm. because it's very difficult to explain to someone what is content marketing. Yeah. You know, maybe they've never heard of it or they don't really understand what it is. Um, and in some way you need to show them what they're going to get for it. So, yeah, it's been an educational process, but mm. it's, it's small steps, you know, and... No, I don't know if Ian wants to add to. I think I think the in in broad terms, I mean the the whole idea to make a, a a profit out of out of anything, I guess, is the question of value. Can can you deliver value? Yeah. Uh, and is that value enough for someone else to give you something in return? Mm -hmm. That's that's the big question. And I think um, w our starting point was to say we want to deliver value to our reader. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that's the the key focus point. And any any decision we make needs to serve the reader. Um, I, I can fully confidently say that's a very bad <laughs> cash flow decision yeah. um, because we, we literally rejected the advertisers because we didn't think that this would give value to the reader. Yeah. Uh, for a startup, that's a, it, it doesn't make sense mm. to say, no thanks, we don't want your money. Yeah. Uh, we'll rather not have it and, and, and keep our reader happy who's not giving us money. Mm. Um, that, that was very tough initially to be able to do that. So. The, the reason why we stuck with it, though, is we knew if we can deliver value to our reader, uh, we'll be able to get loyalty and attention. And obviously, in the world of online, that is yeah. worth gold. Um, there's, there's so much noise, so much being published, so many places where people can get whatever we're offering. Uh, why would they get it from us? Yeah. Uh, and so we wanted to secure that. If we can have people's attention and, and have that kind of loyalty of, of readers who actually love what we're doing and that create a personal connection, we believe that's valuable. Uh, and if we can um, almost reach, reach that niche audience, mm -hmm. they'll be able to deliver value yeah. to our advertisers. Because if you can get the right advertiser for your audience, obviously it will serve your audience, not annoy them. It won't be, you know, spammy ads. It's actually yeah. something that they're interested in. And of course, that, that increases conversions or, or value for the, for the business who's advertising with yeah. us. Yeah. So it was definitely a long strategy. Yeah. Uh, we weren't sure if it's going to pay off. Um, yeah. we w we, I mean, it was a chance we took. It was something we saw that was broken in the, in the way that people were w using the kinds of medias um, that we wanted to enter. Yeah. Um, but it is hard. I mean, the, the big question still lies on online. If, if you're giving away something for free, how are you going to monetize mm. it? Um, and that, that's a, it is a, a challenge. Um, the, the key answer is you need to deliver value. Yeah. And so w that's, that's always going to be the question with the Pretty Blog as well. How can we keep giving more value uh, mm. to more people uh, in order to get something in exchange? And obviously a monetization model so that that would be money because we've got bills to pay and Mm. That's what it takes to, to right. operate. Mm. Um, so that will always be the question going forward. And I think it's going to change quite a bit because I, I, I still don't think the publishing industry has been figured out. I still don't think yeah. online blogging as a business has been figured out. I think some people are getting it right. Some people are s still in the dark about it. So I think a lot of this will, will still change. And uh, we are also in the process of, of changing once again, adapting the bus business model and, and making tweaks as we go yeah. um, in order to, to run it as a business that's actually you know, going to be around for a while. Yeah. And, and in the business that we are in, we have to create content. And like Ian said, like to produce something that's of value, we always believed in creating amazing content. So with the visual aspect of the Pretty Blog, being a photographer, I think yeah. that was quite an easy thing is to um, reject certain submissions mm. simply because the photography, I didn't feel, you know, fits with, with what we wanted with to, standard, yeah, yeah, with our standard. So it was always a very, um, like, really picky kind of yeah. process. Um, but, yeah, as Ian said, like, we think it's, Paying off. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, this is a, a, a great example, once again, of how passion can change a business from just a normal little business to something that becomes super successful. And, Ian, from you guys, your, your side, the Plus Plus Minus is one of your, your setups. Um, tell us more about Plus Plus Minus and how that came about. So Plus Plus Minus is a web development and design company. 
on the face of it. That's, yeah. that's, that's what we're marketing it as. <laughs> um, what's actually going on behind the scenes is that uh, we, we are serving clients and, and creating amazing websites uh, for them. We think the internet needs a, not a lot of help. I don't yeah. think <laughs> it's, it's working as it should. There's a lot of rubbish and it needs yeah. a lot of fixing. So it's definitely something we enjoy doing, um, using technology to, to serve a business or a, a, a organization's goals. Um, and that's how we approach it from a, a client perspective. Okay. But what it allows us to do is to collect expertise, uh, get insights into an industry and uh, develop technology that can ultimately you know, serve other businesses or be re repackaged into, into different solutions. So yeah. that's the part that gets, gets us really excited. So with the Pretty Blog, it's one example. Because we work so, so closely together, um, we as the development or tech side behind the, the Pretty Blog uh, gets to see what are they struggling with, um, what about publishing is hard, uh, what needs to be fixed, um, and how can we add value to a client like the Pretty Blog. And a lot of those answers we can figure out and we obviously test it with the Pretty Blog goals, um, but it allows us to create technology and, and ultimately businesses that will be able to serve those kind of things. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's how it, uh, it came up, or that's what it is now. Um, starting out, it was, it was literally me in my, in my bedroom building a website <laughs> for one of my mom's friends. That, that was the start of it. Um, it wasn't called Plus Plus Minus back then, but uh, it, it evolved into, yeah. into this. So going forward, um, how do you guys feel the, the future of marketing and all that's going to go towards? Or how, how do you think it's going to be impacted by blogging or social media? And that is it going to be super important to have all those things included in your business strategy, strategy or is it something that's not that important? I think it's very, very important. Um, when people ask us, you know, what social media platforms should we be on? You know, should yeah. we blog? Should we be on Pinterest? Should we be on Facebook? Ian always has a very good answer to that. Um, and I'm going to use it now. <laughs> but that... <laughs> I'm, <laughs> but I'm but outsourcing <laughs> this interview right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I will give credit to where credit's due. Um, it's, it's basically that you need to be on all the platforms that you can uh, maintain. Because there's no use in having a Twitter account and that you still have the little egg, yeah. you know, <laughs> as your picture. Yeah. Yeah. And you should, you should definitely only be on the platforms that you can maintain and that you can keep up. And I um, actually had a meeting with a business today. And again, this came up where they were like, don't you know someone that can actually handle our social media? Because they try to do it in-house, but they just don't have the time. Yeah. And it is a full-time job. So yeah. I think that whole idea of marketing within businesses, I think it depends on like which industry you're in. Yeah, yeah. But if you're in the creative, especially in the media, um, yeah, anything creative, you definitely need to get on it. But how you do it, I think, is different for each industry and how, yeah. how much and how frequent, etc. But I think for the specific industry that we are in, um, it's, it's such a great tool to use and it's, it basically comes free, but you need to invest a lot of time and the right strategies, etc., into it. But I really think that it's, you know, for, especially for creative industry, I think that is the way forward. But um, how it will evolve and how people, you know, will um, look at it within five years, I don't know. I yeah. don't know what the answers <laughs> are, but I think it's kind of like using it as you go and figuring out how people, I mean, now with Facebook, we've seen a huge change, you know, yeah. since they've changed the algorithm. So it's also something we're asking at, at the Pretty Blog, you know, is Facebook still the way forward? And I think the idea is to really use it and see, like, how long is it still going to work for us? Yeah. Um, I, I actually read a, a whole article on twi Facebook versus Twitter, yeah. and they're saying Twitter is going to outlast Facebook because you can you have so much more interaction with people, yeah. and it's real interaction, mm -hmm. and also you get connected with super successful people, yeah. whereas Facebook is moving more towards this business side, yeah. which is pushing people more and more away. And I, I don't know, it's just, this is just from personal thing, but I think with Facebook, now when I go on Facebook, it feels so noisy. Yeah. There's so much stuff clutter. happening, so much so clutter, clutter, so much photograph, personal photos and business yeah. and everything mixed. Where with Twitter, it's kind of like more cleaner interface. I really choose who I follow. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it, it feel for me personally, it feels more the way forward, but I don't know, in two years, there might be something else. In five yeah. months, there might be something oh, else. <laughs> what, what about you, Ian? What, what platform <laughs> have you chosen? Well, I'll... 
uh, in broad terms, if we're talking about social media and marketing, where it's going and the importance of that, I think Christine gave a very polite answer. I'll be a bit more <laughs> aggressive about it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Eric Coleman, who, who used the term, you know, obviously the question is, what's your return on investment? It is hard to do. It's a lot of time. Christine says it's a full-time job. Um, most people don't know or understand, so it's going to take investment. And your your reaction time is, is, is normally quite slow. It's not yeah. like you, you implement a strategy this week, this month, this quarter, and you, you, you see the fruit of it. It, mm. it. it typically takes years and then it works. So what's your return on investment? Eric Coleman says your, the ROI of social media will be that you are still in business. Um, and, and that's what I believe it is gonna come down to. If you are in any industry that is doing business with people, um, this type of marketing, let's call it social media for lack of a better word, um, will be the future of the business. Yeah, like um, an online presence sort of thing. It's a, let's call it online presence, presence um, but a, a personal uh, aspect where you actually delivering value and content yeah. to a very niche group of people not the masses yeah uh, that is that very targeted very specific very valuable mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I don't think you, we're gonna have a choice that that will be the way the tricky thing about social media and this is th the secret is by the time everyone is on a specific platform, you're too late. Yeah. Or it's gonna be too hard or too expensive to become right. big on it. Right, and, and that's where the early adopter in me jumps on things. So um, we were on Twitter early. I, I, I don't know the exact date. <laughs> no, I don't think Twitter was around 2006, but it felt like that. Uh, <laughs> it was like when you met someone that was actually on Twitter in South Africa, it was like, hey, wow, you, you're one <laughs> of those guys, you know? Yeah. It was very early on. So to, to, to see a return on your investment there was, was pretty much, you know, insignificant. You can't measure no that. You didn't see it. it yeah. No one knew about it. No one used it. I'm going to take those dates because I only think it's 2007 or 6. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Twitter <laughs> was not around in 2006. <laughs> I'm checking it it's off the It's 2009. <laughs> this is recorded. <laughs> okay, anyway, so, but, but the, the thing about a social network is the sooner you're on it, the easier it is to get traction. Yeah. Uh, and so now, you know, you, you go to YouTube and suddenly you think, uh, I need a YouTube strategy. And you look at other people with millions of followers and you're like, how on earth did this happen? How did they get there that fast? And you're like, yeah. maybe they've started on YouTube 10 years ago when no one else knew about it because then it's very cheap in terms of time um, and money to be able to get on a network and actually yeah. get traction. Um, as soon as everyone's on it, it's really hard to stand out from the noise. So newer networks like um, the Snapchat or whatever, you know, Secret, or there's, there's a whole host of these guys coming out so now. So many platforms, eh? So many platforms. And the question is, which ones do you invest time yeah. in? And the, the, the theoretical right answer is all of them. Yeah. If, if there's a chance that your potential customers are on that network, you need to be on them. Yeah. And some of these networks, if you look at the demographics, there's, there's some of these networks that um, specific demographics are on, like younger generations, they're not interested in Facebook and Twitter yeah. as much anymore. Um, it's Instagram and Snapchat. Yeah. So if, if you've got a business serving those people and you don't know you what Snapchat is, that, you, you're gonna fall behind. By the time the big businesses get on Snapchat and everyone knows about it, uh, you're gonna be like, oh, I need to get a social media guru to tell me what my snap mm -hmm. s Snapchat strategy <laughs> <Yeah>. should be. <laughs> uh, that's gonna so be quite I late and hard. <laughs> So that's, that's the hard part. Uh, it, it, it does take some figuring out. And yeah. it, 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 there's a lot of guessing involved as well because not all the networks stay around. If yeah. you were big on MySpace, you know, <laughs> you uh, don't exist anymore. Yeah, and, MySpace <laughs> and that's why you need to connect with the people behind it. You're not connecting in a, in a specific network. You're connecting with the people there. So if the network moves, the people come with you. Uh, and that's the secret. That's why it should be personal. It should be re relational. And, and that's where I believe marketing, uh, not just going, it is there. And uh, I mean, it's not n new news, um, but it's a, I think it's a, a stark reminder that uh, if you're marketing for masses, you, you're bound to miss or overspend. Yeah. yeah, and I think companies need to change their kind of viewpoint on marketing. Like you asked like where marketing's going. Yeah. And if I had to answer that, I would say companies need to change their view on that because it's, it's still very much perceived. And I think some companies are getting it right, but a lot of companies are still looking at it as like, we want to push out a message to whoever's out there and we need to sell, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. And yes, we do want to sell. I mean, at the end, we all need to make an income or, you know, but the, the, the problem with that strategy is that the masses out there, they are not taking those messages anymore. You know, mm -hmm. they are just blind to it. They're just blind to kind of that, like pushing out information to them. And um, where social media comes in is it really 
helps you or it has the ability if you use it right mm. um, to and that, that's the little mm. disclosure but that's the thing like a lot of companies are still using like all these new methods or new platforms in an old mentality okay. and that's the big problem but if you use it in the right way um, and you use it with this idea of I actually want to add value to the people out there and you want to connect to people like Ian said you're really looking at what the people are wanting what mm. they're saying um, even like a short or small little message on Twitter, you could really make that reader feel or that person feel like, wow, this brand really cares. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Like people want to feel like brands care. You know, yeah. people want to feel like those that company really is interested in my life. They're not just interested in selling me a T-shirt. They're actually interested in how I feel when I wear that T-shirt, something yeah, like true. that. Yeah. And I think that's where people will get it right when they use all of these things for marketing is if they really care. Yeah. Um, and that's very difficult, especially with bigger corporations. And I think that's why the smaller businesses are actually getting it right yeah. because they really do care. Yeah, definitely. It's, going, it's moved from the sales-driven sort of mentality to value proposition yes. mentality. I think the new generation has become way more savvy yeah. when it comes to the salesman sort of approach and they want real yeah. quality at yeah. the end of the day and, and you want people to talk about your business and i think if you target all those smaller guys um yeah. you know and they they start talking about you it will result into sales oh, it's yeah, it's inevitable yeah, i mean yeah, apple is probably the best um example, you know yeah. one to use so cool so what about i mean we, we've mentioned the different social media sort of platforms but what about the future of blogging i mean it's huge in the States and Europe and that sort of stuff. But what about in South Africa, like going forward? How do you, how, what do you think it's going to do? I'd, we're definitely seeing a wave of, um, of, of blogs appearing and, and bloggers appearing. I think where, where it's going in the future is not, the concept of blogging isn't going away. If we use the concept of blogging, of blogging to explain um, publishing online, because um, I think that's, that is ultimately what it is. We've moved way past where blogging is a you know a diary or you know just pictures of my cat, yeah. uh, they're obviously still around. <laughs> but that's <laughs> we are, that's not the only thing you find on that's blogs anymore. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think blogging's format is going to change. I think obviously with uh, microblogging coming around, you know yeah. things like Tumblr, and well, Postress, uh, rest in peace, and <laughs> you know uh, Twitter's it's it's blogging. It's just a, a different way of blogging, and I think that's that's definitely the format is going to change. Where I think it, it is getting in more interesting is where, where blogging gets more um, curated almost. If you look at a platform like, like Medium or Exposure, um, it's, it's ultimately still blogging, but now you've got curation taking place or organization or experts coming together yeah. about around certain topics. Mm -hmm. So the collective reading experience becomes much more interesting. Yeah. Something like exposure.io. Sort of exposure. Yeah, and, and, and you get your plat platforms that are much more visual orientated it's, uh, around photo stories. Mm -hmm. Now I can still blog a photo story on, on Blogger or any, any other platform, but exposure.io as a platform provides a different experiencing mm. because of the way it's, it's curating and mm. the way it's organizing publishing. I think that, uh, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, I think, I think more and more people are going to blog, uh, not maybe in the sense that we know it. Uh, I think the tools are going to become simpler and easier. Yeah. Mm. Um, much the, the barrier to entry is even going to be less um, than what it is. Uh, and I think it's going to be the, the the ultimate way of personally connecting. Um, you know, the there's a there's a big argument against social networks, in the sense that all the content that you publish, everything that you put out there, uh, essentially is not your own. Mm. Um, you are giving permission for any other platform to use that. If something like Facebook was to go down, and your entire marketing effort was uh, on Facebook, and yeah. all your your updates or posts or whatever value existed on Facebook. They close down. Uh, you're essentially back to square yeah. one, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can blog or create content or drive people to your own platform, that becomes interesting. So, yeah. something like uh, your your own blog on your own service. Y you know, that's I own my content, yeah. and um, I think that's why we're seeing a resur uh, such a, a, a resurgence in. Um, email marketing yeah. uh, email newsletters and email marketing it's like it's it made the weirdest comeback like yeah. Yeah, when it's you talk about that now, oh yeah. it's it is the, the thing right now oh yeah stuff. i mean it's not like the old school rabbit no rabbit. no so it, i i love the the, the comeback story of of, yeah. of email and i think the main reason because of that is you can own a list 
Um, doesn't matter what Facebook, Twitter, or any other network does. Yeah. Um, I can own. I can own the list. Yeah. Uh, I've, it's persons, people who I have access to, and that I can communicate to, and and that essentially is, it's so valuable in terms of taking your yeah. business forward. Brilliant. Well, I think, guys, we could really <laughs> sit here and chat <laughs> for hours and hours, but I'm going to ask you one last question. If you had to give any advice to any startups or any young entrepreneurs that are wanting to get going with anything, what would that advice be? I would say, um, firstly, start. Like we said earlier, you know, make sure that you don't wait a long or don't wait too long before you start something because yeah. rather fail at something um, but know something after that and move on. Because I know everything Ian and I have tried did not work out, you know, and mm. everything we tried, at least we learned something from it. And going forward, it's so much easier to make decisions because you kind of know what hap what worked, what didn't work. So I think that would probably be my first initial um, advice be. And then the second thing would be to not look too much to the competition. I think that's a big problem, especially if you start, if you just pass the starting mark, you know, and you kind of see things happening. And it's, it's really, you could be so sidetracked by looking at what pe other people do. I think it's important to know what's going on in your industry and it's important to kind of have an ear to the ground. I think that is just mm -hmm. always important, but not to be so sidetracked and be so into what other people are doing because otherwise you're just, you're not focusing on what yeah. you should be doing. Um, so that's something I think Ian and I always try and do. Yeah. So m my, my piece of advice, we g it's exactly the same as Christine's first one. I think it's the most valuable lesson that anyone can apply is to actually do something. Mm -hmm. um, nothing can teach you more than experience. Uh, that's essential. You have to do it. We can throw in whatever cliche, you know, just do <laughs> it or what. There's, there's loads of them, but do something. And whether it works or not, you learn. Uh, and that's how you discover. Mm -hmm. my so that's the, the important one. The, the other one would probably be to yes, I was right <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the other one w which which I sh probably should have applied more in, in in my life looking back so this is the one I, I should have learned sooner is to to learn much more from other people people who've gone before you people who's got a different perspective than you people from different industries people from the same industry to really learn from uh, the mistakes that they've made you don't y we learn a lot from mistakes but you learn I think almost as much from other people's, yeah, peop other people's mistakes, and it's much cheaper to do that. Much cheaper. And um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that would be the main thing. So and quicker. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. So <laughs> any older, younger, different perspective than you, uh, learn from whatever you can from those people. Um, you, you don't have to you know, reinvent the wheel and, and do everything um, for a first time in that sense. Yeah. Uh, other people m most probably have done something similar to what you've done. You might think that you're the the first pioneer to ever attempt this, but pr yeah. someone else probably tried it already Most or yeah. something similar and they've yeah. learned something in the process uh, and to, to be able to learn from that is worth gold. Yeah. yeah, I think when you start as an entrepreneur, I think the great thing is that you, you kind of think you know everything, which is <laughs> awesome because that helps you just to start and go like, I can do this, yeah. you know, like how difficult can yeah, it be? But um, I think the reality of it is the older we, we get, um, and I turned 30 this year, which, which was a big thing for me. And the older I get, it's probably a cliche, but the more I realize I actually don't know anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't say this on camera. But I think that's the reality of yeah. it, is the older you get, the more you realize, actually, I don't know a lot. Yeah. And, and I think that, that, that helps me to actually want to discover more. And also, like Ian said, listen to older people. You yeah. know, I think it's that classic example of a teenager not wanting to listen to their parents <laughs> because they're like, they don't know anything, you know. Classic. But when you get older, you realize your parents actually knew quite a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so funny, yeah. And you should have actually just listened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Guys, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And I definitely have learned a lot. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to hearing more from... The Pretty Blog and <laughs> from Plus Plus Minus and everything else you guys are involved in. Thanks cool. for your time. Oh, thanks, thanks for having so us. Cool. Watch the space. <laughs> <laughs>